the broad theme that we came away from was that January 6th itself, while shocking, wasn't surprising, or at least shouldn't have been surprising. Because when you go back, we're the first book that goes for four years and tries to tell the, the tale from the beginning to the end of his presidency. And when you go back and research it as we did, we saw how it all came together. That this wasn't a one-off, it wasn't an aberration. It was a four-year war mm -hmm. on democratic norms and institutions. That was Peter Baker, co-author of the best-selling book, The Divider, Trump in the White House 2017 to 2021, which Peter co-authored with his wife, Susan Glasser. I'm Mark Lawrence. And I'm Mark Updegrove, and this is With the Bark Off. Peter Baker is the chief White House correspondent for The New York Times a political analyst for MSNBC, and the author of several books on the presidency, including Days of Fire and The Breach. Susan Glasser is a staff writer for The New Yorker and a CNN global affairs analyst. Their first assignment as a married couple was as Moscow bureau chiefs for The Washington Post, after which they wrote Kremlin Rising. They also co-authored The Man Who Ran Washington, a New York Times bestseller. In this episode of With a Bark Off, we go back to a conversation that I had with Peter and Susan at the LBJ Presidential Library last month concerning our 45th President, Donald Trump. And I have to say, Mark, this is uh, not only a book, but a conversation I was really looking forward to. The book, I've read many on Donald Trump, as, as have you, but this one is the first one to cover it from beginning to end, and from two journalists who were there watching it happen as it was playing out. It's true, Mark. This is, at the moment at least, the definitive account of the Trump presidency. And I was reminded just how much happened in those years. <laughs> right. Perhaps the, the most spectacular events happened at the very end of the presidency, obscuring so much perhaps of what came earlier. But of course, these were years of two impeachments, dramatic diplomacy with respect to the NATO alliance, Iran, and so many other parts of the world in almost a steady day-by-day -day drumbeat of chaos. But all credit to Peter and Susan for imposing some order and telling that story in a really clear way. It was, it was a time of, of, of just sheer whiplash. You know, no sooner would you see one, you know, chaotic event play out than another one was, was happening before your eyes. And, you know, we've talked about many presidents on this podcast, Mark, but there is no presidency or president as anomalous as Donald Trump. It's really true. There have been American presidents, of course, who've been caught up in scandals, who've been caught up in enormous controversy, but not from beginning to end. <laughs> right. I think that, uh, right. That's what really stands out, I think, about the Trump presidency. It was a sustained period of upheaval and, uh, and chaos, I don't think, is too strong a word. And division, which gets to the title of Peter and Susan's book. And I talked to them. I led off this conversation, Mark, by asking them, based on the fact that they were there day in and day out of the, the presidency, when, when they put it all together, what surprised them? What really struck them about the Trump presidency? Uh, you know, we covered a lot of stories. I think you mentioned that very generous introduction. We covered the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq. We covered the rise of Vladimir Putin in Russia. We never thought we would be writing stories like this about our own capital, about Washington, mm. D.C. And in fact, uh, you know, to the question of what surprises you, there's only one thing in this book uh, that we wrote in any other book. And... Um, our first book was called Kremlin Rising, and it was about Vladimir Putin's Russia. And uh, we were there about 10 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and there were already big questions about Russian democracy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were at an event with Grigor Yavlinsky, a very well-known Russian reformer. He was asked, well, what about the state of Russian democracy? And he told this anecdote that stuck with us at the time, uh, and we put that in our first book. It's an old one. Uh, that will be familiar to anyone who lived in, in Russia in those years. Uh, it's one about an ambulance driver who picks up a guy, and uh, after a while they're driving through the city, 
The guy says, hey, wait a minute, where are we going? And the ambulance driver says, well, we're going to the morgue. <laughs> the guy says, well, what do you mean? I'm not dead. Uh, and the ambulance driver says, yeah, well, we're not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, that was a kind of a, a, a sad, you know, morbid joke about Russian democracy 20 years ago. Now you couldn't even tell that joke about Russia. And somehow it seemed kind of sadly relevant to the Washington that we've been covering. So that's the only thing that uh, appears in two of our books. Hmm. Peter, how about you? Did, you've covered every administration since Clinton and written books about the Clinton, George W. Bush, Obama, and now Trump administrations. As you put this story together, page after page, did anything strike you about this period? Well, it's kind of become a cliche in Washington in the Trump era to say that there is nothing surprising, but everything is shocking, mm. right? In other words, that he still has the capacity to shock us, even if we should not be surprised anymore. Just the other day, what did he say? He said that the certain rules in the Constitution should be terminated so that he could be returned to office right away rather than you know, go run for re-election or something like that. And that it was shocking, but not surprising. Mm. And I think that what we discovered in writing this book was how many times we were shocked by things we thought we knew, but in fact, there was a whole lot more to it than we knew, or things we didn't know that we could find out in the time after he left office. A handful of examples come to mind, you know, when he talks to his chief of staff, John Kelly, and he says, you effing generals, how come you can't be loyal to me like the German generals were? Well, what German generals do you mean, John Kelly says? You know, Hitler's generals in World War II. And he says, well, sir, you know, they did try to kill him three times. <laughs> No, they were very loyal. So is that, is that surprising or shocking, right? It's shocking that he would want Hitler's generals to be his vision of who worked for him, but it's not surprising anymore. And I think that the, the broad theme that we came away from was that January 6th itself, while shocking, wasn't surprising, or at least shouldn't have been surprising. Because when you go back, we're the first book that goes for four years and tries to tell the, the tale from the beginning to the end of his presidency. And when you go back and research as we did, we saw how it all came together. That this wasn't a one-off, it wasn't an aberration. It was a four-year war mm. on democratic norms and institutions, as Susan talked about with the joke uh, involving the Russians. That was what was happening. So January 6th, if you think about it and you pay attention to it, especially if you go back and look at it in hindsight, was the inevitable outcome in some ways of what was going on. Let's go back to 2016. Was Trump's nativism, his, uh, his xenophobia, did he adapt his message for uh, the electorate at that time? Or is this something that he was sounding for years and years and years and the electorate caught up? I mean, there's really two, two, two kinds of politicians. There's the Ronald Reagan, who in 1964 sounded the same message that he did in 1980, but the American voters caught up to that message. And then there's the Bill Clinton, more amorphous, somebody who adapted to the electorate in 1992 and changed his own stances on things in order to become a viable candidate. Where does Trump fall into that spectrum? Well, uh, you know what's interesting is that if you want to get a shock uh, and you want to know what Donald Trump thinks about a lot of world issues, you don't need to uh, listen to what he said in 2016 or 2018. You can actually read an interview that he did with Playboy magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Playboy magazine. Uh, in 19, it came out in early 1991, so it was in 19, or early 1990 basically at the very end of the Cold War. And you know this Playboy interview, uh, even Angela Merkel was reading this as a guide to what Donald Trump thought. Uh, he wasn't in politics you know, for decades to come. He was just a, you know, a sort of brash, uh, you know, publicity hungry, soon to be multiple bankrupt uh, New York City property developer. But he even then fancied himself uh, you know, to be a kind of uh, world historical figure. He had uh, our previous book pointed out he had volunteered himself uh, <laughs> to uh, George H.W. Bush uh, to serve as his vice president, an offer that was uh, kindly declined uh, by, uh, by Bush. He had uh, volunteered actually to be Ronald Reagan's arms control negotiator because, as everyone here knows by now, Donald Trump is the greatest negotiator in the history of the world. Um, <laughs> But, but beyond the personality quirks that didn't change, what really is amazing is um, a lot of those, I wouldn't call them fully formed policy views, but certainly his kind of world view and his instincts, remarkably similar, uh, even though the world changed so much. He uh, lamented that Mikhail Gorbachev was not a strong enough leader. He actually praised 
uh, the Chinese crackdown on Tiananmen Square. Mm -hmm. Uh, so even then, he had this affinity for autocrats and authoritarians. He uh, was very much a protectionist, even then. At the time, of course, the issue was trade with Japan rather than China. Uh, and in fact, in the reporting for The Divider, his worldview was so set in the 1980s. Uh, some of his White House officials told us that in early months in the White House, he would often say Japan when he meant to be talking about China, mm. because that was his frame of reference. So you can read uh, you know, this uh, early interview with Playboy magazine as if it was like a Rosetta Stone to Donald Trump. But I would put one asterisk there, because I do think that as a communicator and as a politician, Donald Trump is always workshopping lines that he thinks will, will work better. Uh, and there are many examples of that. There he would start talking about things uh, on the campaign trail in 2015 and 2016 and you know drop them, basically, if uh, uh, people didn't really respond to them. So he definitely had a sort of feedback loop uh, with what he wanted to talk about. And since he doesn't really care about policy very much, uh, you know, he was a lot more willing than many politicians just to say what he thinks people want him to say. Peter, you write in the book that a senior national security official who regularly observed Trump in the Oval Office compared him to a, vo a vo velocirator uh, in the movie Jurassic Park that proved capable of learning while hunting their prey making them ultimately more dangerous. Trump, uh, in characteristic immodest form, said, uh, called himself a, a stable genius. How would you describe Donald Trump's native intelligence? <laughs> By the way, that's very stable genius. Very stable genius, yeah. Um, very, very stable genius. Very, very stable very. genius. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good, good, good question. He would probably be offended by the Velociraptor comparison. He would be a T-Rex, I think, in his mind. But the Velociraptor, what the, what the official meant was that in this movie, for those who've forgotten it, there's a scene where the kids are running from the, from the killer dinosaur, and they go into the industrial kitchen, and they close the door, and they think they're safe, right? But then the Velociraptor has learned to turn the handle of the industrial kitchen, which is a uh, sign of learning how to do things that otherwise were not within the animal's natural instincts. And that's what this official meant about Trump. He's not going to learn about policy details about health care. He probably couldn't tell you more about health care reform today than he could have six years ago. But he has figured out how to, to manage the levers of power. And that is to get rid of the John Kellys, who were not like Hitler's generals, and to get people in there who would be more deferential to him, who were more willing to go along with the things he wanted, who if it were not uh, Mike Pence, might have gone along with him even on January 6th had he had a different vice president, right? And so I think, you know, he, he's not a policy wonk, okay, in terms of intelligence. He's not going to be a master of details. I think he has trouble processing certain information. I remember being with him in an interview in the Oval once where he just clearly didn't understand what we were talking about. But he has a cunning about him that is hard to match in, in modern politics. The cunning of understanding a we uh, an opponent's weakness, the cunning of understanding even the weaknesses or vulnerabilities, as Susan always likes to say, of the people who actually want to work for him. Mm. He understands their weaknesses and vulnerabilities and how to take advantage of them in order to get them to do what he wants them to do. So it's, it's not an IQ as much as an EQ of sorts, I suppose, um, but that has, you know, that made him successful in a way that no other non-politician ever has been, right? He's the only president who's ever served in our entire country who'd never spent a day in public life in either government or the military. And yet he managed to use this cunning, this instinct he has for you know, bombastic populism, for weaknesses of his enemies, uh, to parlay it into um, the Oval Office. And he did it in part, as you say, because we were a divided country and he is a master divider who came along at the moment where he fit the times. It, it, in terms of disagreeing, with you. Uh, he called the media infamously the enemy of the people. When Leslie Stahl asked him during a 60 Minutes interview why he did this, you write in the book, he replied, you know why I do it. I do it to discredit you all and demean you all so that when you write negative stories about me, no one will believe it. What was it like to be a member of the press corps during the Trump years relative to your experiences in other administrations? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, every president hates us. <laughs> I mean, Mark, you've written, you've interviewed multiple presidents, you've written books on, on, on JFK, LBJ, the Bushes. I mean, you know, 
that it's built in, is baked in, uh, um, and, and that's fine. That's okay. That's, it's part of the system. We're, it's an adversarial system. We're not supposed to be their friends. Um, what Trump did, of course, was take it to a different level, right? When you say again and again words like fake news uh, and you use phrases like enemies of the people, um, what you're doing is not saying, I think this story is not fair, or I think this reporter is not fair. What you're saying is, the, I don't believe in the very concept of a free press. Mm -hmm. And he's undermining the very nature of our uh, system, really. And it has worked. Our credibility, due to our own you know, work, has always been somewhat suspect in polls. It's gone down substantially since then. I think we're just barely above Congress, which is a little like, you know, <laughs> uh, the toad being above the frog. But... Um, it, it, it's, 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 he wanted to do exactly what you just said, he told Leslie Stahl, to discredit anybody, so any source of information other than himself. I was struck the other day, just Friday, that Vladimir Putin said the same thing to a reporter there. He says, D don't trust anybody. The only person you can trust is me. That would distill Donald Trump's approach toward the media as well. Mm -hmm. Don't trust anybody, only trust me. And it was a corrosive thing. I mean, obviously, on the one hand, he was the most transparent president I've ever covered. He talked to us more than any other president. He gave us more interviews. He gave us more sound bites, more press conferences, more pool reports, more pool sprays. And, you know, whereas Biden, for instance, doesn't do that much at all by comparison. Um, and yet, as, as enamored as he is of attention, as, as, as hungry as he is, as Susan said, for publicity, um, this broader notion that anything is fake unless I tell you otherwise is corrosive to the system. Susan, did, did it make you, did, did this kind of scrutiny that he puts you under, this kind of vilification, did, did it make you change your behavior in any way as a reporter? How did you change as a consequence of that kind of treatment by the President of the United States? Well, I mean, I think, you know, there's the positive side of this in some respects is that uh, the Trump years were really a moment of return to first principles for journalists in, in a way that is probably healthy uh, and good. Uh, if there were ever uh, a reason to suit up and to you know, understand the value of independent, critical-minded, honest reporting uh, and the urgency around doing so, uh, you know, this, this is literally, this is why we become journalists yeah. in many respects. It's not uh, to have access to the halls of power. It's not to be popular, certainly. Uh, all presidents uh, are unhappy in some way about their coverage. It's a question of their ability to suppress uh, their, their, their disagreement with it, uh, you know. But Donald Trump, you know, I think was really about a crisis in American democracy in a way that I think, you know, gave journalism you know, a sense of mission. And I think that's really important, understanding the value that we must continue to place on uh, independent, uh, fact-driven reporting. Um, you know, we're all products, all three of us, right? We grew up uh, at a time when, you know, there was much more of a, a single kind of national public space, right? You know, there were three television networks. There were, you know, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, Time Magazine and Newsweek. There was a sense that we could, uh, you know, agree at least on a basic level about the facts, uh, even if uh, the country disagreed uh, and vigorously so over what to do about them. It's not like the 1980s was a period of, you know, kumbaya, mm. but I think that, uh, you know, looking at a moment where uh, you have the weaponization of facts and information by a president of the United States in that way, to me, it was really uh, an important moment as a journalist to understand, uh, you know, that what we're doing really matters. I'll add a story, by the way, I meant to, I should have added this. I, I remember being in the Oval with Trump one time with my publisher, A.G. Sulzberger mm -hmm. from the New York Times. And A.G. sat through the interview, let us ask our questions. Trump gave his answers, but he just wanted to say one thing at the end. And he says to the president, he says, listen, I just want you to understand that when you say things like enemies of the people and fake news, there's real consequence there. It puts people in danger, not just so much in this country, but around the world, journalists around the world, because less principled uh, leaders will use this as a way to jail journalists, to intimidate journalists, to do violence against journalists. And there's examples of that, as we saw repeatedly over the years in some places around the world. And he brought this directly to, his, to, to Trump. And I was really 
glad he did, that he said this directly to him. There's consequences. He did it politely, but he did it firmly, and he said, this is something you should really think about before you do it, because there's consequences. And Trump says, really? You think so? Huh. I hadn't thought of that. That's really interesting. And then a week later, he was doing it all over again. Couldn't, did, didn't matter a thing to him. Did, did, Susan, did, did, um, did journalism get better as a result of the Trump administration? You know, I think we talk often in a very broad brush way about journalism. Obviously, we hear all the time, you know, about the media is this, the media that, uh, you know, like any profession, there's bad actors, there's, uh, you know, there's excellence, both commingled. But in my view, uh, there is a little bit of a misunderstanding about uh, Trump. You often hear, of course, Trump's complaints uh, to the, the conservative media, but there's also a liberal uh, critique as well of the coverage. I, you know, how many times over the last few years we would hear people say, well, somehow the New York Times, because of the Hillary Clinton email coverage, uh, you know, gave us Donald Trump. I, my take is a little bit different, which is to say that, um, you know, probably no one ever had as much, you know, hard hitting, you know, rigorous independent journalism committed about them before entering public life as Donald Trump. Uh, you know, there was a stack of five excellent, uh, deeply reported uh, biographies about Donald Trump uh, even before he announced his campaign. I brought that group together actually when I was editor of Politico magazine in the spring of 2016. Uh, they'd never met each other, these biographers, going all the way back to the very legendary Wayne Barrett who was uh, the investigative reporter for the Village Voice. You could read Wayne Barrett's 1979 profile of Donald Trump and learn an awful lot about the guy who was going to go on to become president. We had this crazy lunch in the basement of Trump Tower at the Trump Grill, uh, and we compared notes. Uh, you know, I sort of tongue in cheek called them the Trumpologists, uh, not really anticipating, you know, that that there would be, I guess, Trumpologists for for decades to come. But I, I say this to say that if you wanted to know what kind of man was Donald Trump, what kind of president would he be? Uh, you knew what you needed to know. Uh, at, thanks to a lot of hard work uh, by a lot of dedicated investigative reporters and authors and journalists and scholars. And, you know, certainly we've learned more uh, since then. But what's remarkable is that, you know, this, I would call it almost this sort of presumed compact, you know, between journalists and their readers. Somehow that is broken down as our political system, uh, you know, has, has entered, I think, a crisis in recent years. And, you know, when I was coming up in journalism, we had the saying, uh, you know, that uh, uh, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Mm. You know, there was this notion, right, that it was our job as journalists to sort of pick up the rock uh, and show you all the creepy crawly things underneath. And then the voters, it was up to them uh, to figure out what to do about it. And I, this link between journalism and accountability, I think, is, is where we are having a crisis. I think that's true. I would add to that, I think, I mean, it has been a test, right, of all the different values and, and structures that we had coming up. We believe in neutrality. We believe in balance. We believe in fairness. We believe in truth. Mm -hmm. How do you reconcile all these values in a time when we are being called fake news all the time, right? Do you respond in a way that makes you look like the opposition, which is what he wants, mm -hmm. okay? And what some of, frankly, his critics want. His critics are mad at us because we're not more of the opposition, and he wants us to make us the opposition, right? I mean, I like what uh, Marty Barron, who was the editor-in-chief of the uh, Washington Post said, we're not at war, we're at work, okay? So that means our job is not to be his opposition. Our job is not to be his opponent, not to be his, you know, uh, his, uh, his skull or his lecture. Our job is to report the truth. As Susan said, to go back to first principles. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not, that we shouldn't rethink some of our ways we do that, right? Good example, the L word. Constant issue in my newsroom for four years. Do we use the L word? Do we say Trump is lying, mm. right? And if so, when do we say that? It's a hard one. It's not as easy as people like to think. You should say it all the time. You should say everything he says is a lie. Okay, I get it. I understand that. First of all, if you use the word all the time, it loses value and it becomes looking like you're screechy rather than you're reporting. But and secondly, we've always been reluctant historically because we don't like to presume that we know what somebody's thinking. If we say somebody said something wrong, that what they say is false, what they say is not true, but do we know for a fact that they know it's not true when they say it? That's in theory what a lie is. 
So we were pretty conservative about that. Our editor, Dean Baquet, did not want to use it all the time. But we did use it. We did use it. We used it on the front page about the birth or lie. Because the theory is that it had been disproven in so many different times that if he continues to say it, he knows or at least has reason to know it's a lie. We say it about the election uh, 2020 stuff, where he says that the election was stolen. We all know that's not true. There's zero evidence of that. We've decided that it's, it's certainly, certainly appropriate to use the L word for that. But more importantly, I think, was just fact-based reporting. And our friends at the Post uh, actually tabulated how many false and misleading statements, some of them you could call lies, that Trump made over four years. It was 30,000 statements that were false or misleading. That is a power unto itself. You don't need to sit there and be a columnist or an opinion journalist and say, shame on you. The fact of that s says it for itself, in my view. Well, except that that's also an example uh, where the accountability has broken down. Uh, and what are the consequences of having a president uh, of the United States who, who lies as he breathes? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, 30,000 lies uh, is the kind of record, uh, whether you call them falsehoods, misstatements, untruths, uh, you know, that's an extraordinary record. And, you know, I mean, one of the big takeaways clearly is that, uh, you know, when you have a rogue president, you know, the tools to constrain that president uh, are mostly not uh, in laws and institutions, they're in individuals. Uh, and, you know, Congress has very, very uh, limited power. Basically, it has, in case of emergency, break glass, and Congress broke the glass twice uh, in the course of the Trump presidency. Uh, with not one but two impeachments and, uh, you know, wasn't able in a polarized system. If anything, what we learned as a result of the Trump presidency is that the mechanism for accountability for a president envisioned by the Constitution is for all intents and purposes non-functional in a divided, polarized country such as we are. It's impossible to envision uh, any president really uh, being able to, you know, be convicted mm. in a Senate that you don't just need 51 votes to convict, right? And it's 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 really almost inconceivable to see impeachment anymore going forward as a meaningful tool of constraining a president, given that polarized political reality. Peter, you write of Fox News that, that uh, they were blessed by Rupert Murdoch. Right-wing TV became Trump TV. Talk about the symbiotic relationship between Donald Trump and Fox News. Yeah, it's remarkable. Um, I mean, you, I know that other presidents or other politicians will say that the, you know, there are some news organizations that were supportive or, un, or not supportive of this president or that president. There's never been anything like this since the earlier days in the presidency when they had a much more overtly partisan press. Now, in the 19th century, you saw this a lot. There were Republican papers and Democratic papers and so forth. But in the modern era, this is a pretty unusual thing, to the point where I remember being in Camp Jardot, Missouri, with Trump on the eve of the 2018 midterm elections, and he's on stage, and suddenly calls up Sean Hannity. Hey, Sean, come on up here. And then he calls up Judge Neen. Hey, Judge Neen, come on up here. And he's just naming all the different anchors on Fox. We like so, and we like Lou, and we like Tucker, and we like, oh, don't we really like, uh, you know, Steve, and so forth. In fact, our friend and colleague, Jane Mayer, uh, reported that he literally gave ratings to the different Fox anchors, you know, like I think Steve Ducey was a 12 out of a scale of 1 to 10, um, and so forth. And I think that there had rarely, if ever, been that kind of symbiotic thing. What's interesting, you talk to people who are Fox veterans today, what they will tell you is they think that might not have happened under Roger Ailes, that the difference was that Fox used to be the, the umpire, if you will, of Republican politics, that you had to go to Fox to suck up to them if you were going to get support among conservatives, that you came to them and they generated, the, you know, they decided. And, 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 you know, there used to be an attitude, one Fox person told me of, uh, F us, F you. You know, there was kind of this, we are brash and we are in charge and don't you dare, Republicans, you know, dare to, 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 to defy us in some way. And Trump turned that around. Mm. They felt the need to take the lead from him. That he intimidated or bullied or coerced or pressured them into to, to following his lead, in effect. They helped make him as a, as a figure by giving these weekly uh, uh, appearances before becoming president on Fox and Friends in the morning where he talked about uh, Barack Obama's birth uh, certificate and all that. And they allowed him to come on at any point he wanted. He did very 
few interviews with other networks compared to what he did with Fox. All of the three or four networks combined, he didn't do enough interviews compared to what he gave to Fox as, as a soul. What's really interesting is how it broke apart at the end, mm. right? The, one of the biggest, most important moments of the Trump's defeat comes when Fox calls Arizona on election night or, uh, and, and says that Biden has won an election there. And the pressure was enormous, enormous, because suddenly you know, they're calling Rupert, they're calling the, the, the Fox journalists and managers. And the, 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 there are journalists at Fox who cared very deeply about the integrity of their report and their polls and refused to back down and said, no, this is what our research shows. Sorry, you may not like it. Maybe we don't like it, but that's what's going to happen here in Arizona. And they were right, by the way. Uh, and they got fired as a result right. by Fox because in the end, Fox couldn't dare to offend not just Trump, but Trump's base because Trump's base was their viewership. But as we look back at the Trump legacy, um, when the eyes of history are cast upon Donald Trump, Susan, is there anything that you think will be a positive reflection of his time in office? I don't, I don't so ask that. I'm so glad you got that question. <laughs> you know, I have to tell you, Mark, uh, you know, I've avoided it for a while. Peter and I, the book came out in September. We consider this to be the most difficult question that we receive <laughs> uh, in the course of the book tour. Uh, you know, usually uh, you get to know a subject of your book, you know, better and you find things you didn't know about them as a person or, you know, Hillary Clinton was asked this question in uh, one of the 2016 debates mm. and she gave at the time, which would be sort of the conventional wisdom of what do you do? You say something nice about the man and his family. Well, he's a good father. Our book contains a fair number of examples that suggest that he's not the best father. So I... <laughs> I, I can't really give you uh, that as the answer in good conscience. Uh, when when uh, his son, Don Jr., was born and his first wife, Ivana, uh, wanted to name him mm -hmm. Don Jr., Donald uh, Trump said, well, are you sure? You know, I don't really want to give my name uh, to somebody who could turn out to be a loser. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, and, and there it went. So. So I'm not going to tell you that, that he's a better father than we thought, because I don't think that's true. Um, you know, the, the view in Washington uh, was that the country could survive four years of Trump, mm. but not eight. Uh, given what a close call the country uh, underwent uh, uh, in January of 2020, and I do think that, uh, sorry, 2021, it, you know, that's what, that's what the history book is going to remember. Barack Obama talked about uh, leaders uh, only aspiring to their own paragraph in history. Mm. I think we know what Donald Trump's paragraph in history is going to be, and it's, it's not going to be a flattering one. What would you, if, if you were to encapsulate that, as you so, did so brilliantly in, in the book, the, the, the chaos of the administration, the divisions in the administration, Peter, what would be, well, let me, let me put it another way. Uh, Claire Booth Luce used to famously lecture presidents. She said, you will be remembered in one sentence. <laughs> What will be your sentence? Wow, he, and, he doesn't even get a, a whole paragraph, just a sentence. Just, uh, <laughs> and she would illustrate, she would say, Lincoln, he freed the slaves. What might Donald's, Donald Trump's sentence, or two, or three, be in history? You know, it's funny you ask. <laughs> no, P Peter's writing his obit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> wow. Uh, at the New York Times, it should be clear, we write... Uh, advanced obituaries on famous figures. We have them of all <laughs> presidents, obviously, and vice presidents and many others as well. We actually have, I think, thousands, if not. I could be wrong about the number. We have a huge number of advanced obits that are sitting in the system waiting to, for their use. And obviously, it's important to have them for people like presidents. And I have written almost all of the living president's obits. So we have, I've had that thought a lot. Like, what do you say? What do you, how do you come up with the one sentence, because that's all you get in a lead, that sums it up? And I'm rewriting the Trump one now because it's, it's a little dated. Uh, and I think it's what we just said. I think it's, you know, that, that you have this um, uh, disruptive force who came and upended American politics and in the, at the end of the day, refused to accept that he had lost and tried to hold on to power uh, through violence and, and, and lies. And I, 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 that's a harsh, harsh judgment. Uh, I would say now, to, to, to Susan's point, if you, you know, did he do anything 
the people would think are good. If you're a conservative, yes, he did. He had a lot of policy things, if you're a conservative, that you would agree with, right? Mm. Tax cuts, regulation cuts, more money for the military, Abraham Accords. You can name some things. That, you know, right. Criminal justice reform, by the way, was a bipartisan uh, uh, bill. Uh, if you are anti-abortion, then you obviously appreciate the three justices put on the Supreme Court that led to the overturning of Roe v. Wade. But I think that the first sentence is about your, your fidelity to the Constitution. You are, as a president, sworn to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. He's just told us in the last month alone he thinks the Constitution should be terminated mm. when it comes to him holding on to power. How is that not the most important and the most singular thing that this president has done compared to the other 46 people who have had that office? Susan, let me deviate from Trump for a moment, probably happily for you, since you've lived this story for so long. <laughs> But let me go back to Moscow um, and ask you about Vladimir Putin. What motivates Vladimir Putin? What, what does Vladimir Putin want right now? Yeah, Vladimir Putin sees himself as a, a modern day, you know, czar, uh, a reincarnation of uh, Russia's imperial ambitions. And, uh, you know, even as a young, uh, uh, not so former KGB agent, deputy mayor, of St. Petersburg in the 1990s, the, the one picture that he hung on his wall, even back then, was that of Peter the Great. Mm. And uh, he sees himself, uh, as he said the other day, he said, well, we, we have acquired more territory. Russia is gaining. Uh, he sees himself in the line of Russia's leaders who, even at, at great cost uh, in lives and treasure, uh, uh, managed to aggrandize uh, and to make Russia an empire again. Uh, I think this was a, a sort of signature moment for Vladimir Putin was the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. And you know, from, from the first day that he was president, he didn't have the means at that time at his disposal. He came in uh, to power uh, not that long after Russia had defaulted on its debt, was in an enormous financial crisis, was at war uh, inside the country to prevent uh, Chechnya from breaking away, uh, you know, was, was a debtor nation, was on its knees. And yet even from the very beginning of his very unlikely uh, time in the Kremlin, Putin really saw himself as, as the, the restorer mm -hmm. and the resurrector of uh, Russia's imperial power, not just within its own borders, uh, but uh, in, its, in its world uh, and in the world at large. Uh, and I do think that you know, he, he has a different tolerance, both for risk uh, and certainly invading Ukraine was an incredibly uh, risky thing to do. But where we see uh, foolhardiness and waste and tragedy uh, and, and the horror of this invasion, uh, I, I think Putin's willingness to keep going on and on for a long time is something that shouldn't be underestimated. He wants to go down in history and thinks that, you know, 100 or 200 years from now, nobody's going to care how many Ukrainians or even how many Russians die mm. in the effort. Uh, what they're going to remember is the glory of uh, a greater Russia. In the same way that St. Petersburg, the city uh, that he was born in, uh, you know, do you remember the bodies uh, of, of those thousands and thousands who died to make the city, or do you remember Peter the Great City? I think we can give Biden due credit for revitalizing a very weakened NATO to rise up against the invasion Donald of Trump wanted to pull out of NATO. That's one of the things in our book. He was much more serious about that than people realize. And Biden has, in fact, kept the alliance, put it back together, really. And I think that's an important thing. Even Europeans would say so. If you, if you look at the, the larger Biden record since he took office, um, as the chronicler of now four presidents, uh, five presidents, excuse me, uh, how, where, where do you, what, what is your evaluation of, of Joseph Biden right now? Well, I think it's too soon to say. Every, every evaluation at the two-year mark has been wrong. Yeah. Reagan would have been seen as a failure after two years which because he had a bad midterm, right? Clinton, obviously, was a failure at two years because he had a bad midterm. Obama, same. Um, I, it's way too soon. I, I do think that, that there is um, a little irrational exuberance among Democrats who think that because they avoided the red wave, suddenly everything's OK again. Mm. Um, it's not. Biden's numbers are the same as they were before. He's still in the low 40s. He has not suddenly become a popular president. Then my colleague, Nate Cohen, had a really important story in the day's paper showing that of voters voting for the House races, 
51% voted Republican, 48% voted Democrat. The Republicans won the House races. What's interesting is, had the Republicans who voted for their House candidates in those swing states voted for their Senate candidates, the Republicans would be in charge of the Senate right now, mm -hmm. which suggests, coming back to our original topic, which is that Trump endorsed candidates cost them the Senate. They would have won in Arizona, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and so forth, had the Republicans simply stuck with their party, but they didn't want to. So that suggests that we're still a very evenly divided country to me right now, and that uh, President Biden has had a lot of successes that he can claim, particularly legislative successes, keeping the alliance together on Ukraine. But um, he still faces a very divided country, and his hopes of unifying us and getting us past this era have obviously not happened yet. Susan, we don't know the first line of uh, Peter's obituary to uh, for, for Donald Trump yet, although you may know it. But we, we New York Times readers don't know that yet. But I, um, I think, without question, one of the first lines of Joe Biden's obituary will be the fact that he defeated Donald Trump for the presidency in 2020. Uh, Donald Trump has announced his candidacy for the presidency in 2024. Joe Biden has yet to do that. Will Joe Biden run for the presidency? Well, Donald Trump has proven to be a uniter of one thing, and that is Democrats, uh, <laughs> who can't necessarily agree on a lot of things, but they did agree and came together around a Biden candidacy in 2020 uh, that was really premised on the idea that, uh, you know, Trump represented some fundamental threat uh, to, to the country, uh, something more along the lines of an existential challenge uh, outside of the normal debates of policy. And I believe that Joe Biden thinks today that regardless of his age, he is the best equipped candidate to defeat Donald Trump once again in his party. So to the extent that Trump remains the front runner, uh, albeit a, a beaten up front runner for the Republican nomination, uh, I think that makes Biden more likely to get in. It appears that uh, the unexpected uh, success in beating back a red wave in November has also uh, heartened and emboldened uh, the, the White House. There's all sorts of tea leaf reading these days in Washington. Uh, Peter's colleague uh, reported the other day uh, a story from the recent state dinner for French President mm -hmm. Emmanuel Macron uh, in which Jill Biden suggested uh, to the French leader that, uh, that Biden was really seriously considering running again. Uh, Macron then gave a toast uh, to his uh, re-election bid. Look, Joe Biden's already the oldest president uh, in American history. If he runs for a second term in office, by the end of that term, he would be 86 years old. Uh, and you know that is going to be a, a very significant issue if he runs again. Now, of course, if he runs against Trump, Trump isn't much younger uh, than Biden. And you know the man who who brought us person, woman, man, camera, TV, uh, you know, uh, is not necessarily in the strongest position uh, to be running, uh, uh, you know, and criticizing his opponent's age. Um, mm. You know, look, we live in this very uh, polarized moment. Uh, politics is more team sport than ever before. Peter pointed out, uh, you know, that essentially it's a kind of a 50-50 election result once again. Uh, in 2022, and you know we're we're seeing these huge swings in control of our institutions based on relatively small swings uh, in our electorate, and so that can make a difference. But the you know the truth is is that politics is a choice. It's not uh, you know in this whole big country mm -hmm. can we come up with somebody better than two octogenarians? <laughs> uh, you know you'd like to think so. You would like to think so. But um, I, I think today, as we're talking, it is, it is very likely and very possible that we could have a 2024 election that is a repeat mm. of the 2020 election. Mark, I have to say, as much as I was anticipating that conversation, I enjoyed it even more than I expected. Peter and Susan are such competent and eloquent journalists that it was a pleasure to have that conversation about uh, about Trump. Their book won't be easily surpassed by another journalist or historian who comes along, as they surely will, <laughs> but this is a, a tremendous start in appreciating all the complexities of the Trump administration. And it's a great way to begin 2023, and in that spirit, we, uh, we have a podcast coming up. We just had the 
The definitive chronicling, at least uh, the first crack at it, from Susan and Peter. And in our next episode, we talk to Chris Whipple, who gives us the first glimpse of the Biden White House with his book, which is the first take on the, the Biden White House, the fight of his life inside Joe Biden's White House. They say that journalists write the first drafts of history. We certainly saw that this time. And next time, we'll have yet another first draft of history. With, with Chris Whipple, who spoke to many White House insiders for his account, including Joe Biden himself. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode of With the Bark Off.